Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I'm really excited you're here. I hope everybody's had some coffee and uh, is feeling energized after last night. Um, I'm really excited to get to come and talk to you about this today, especially I grew up in Calgary. Uh, so it's always a treat for me to get to come home and be in the beautiful mountains. Um, I'm going to talk today about empowering personal decision making in health and wellness. Um, drawing a few examples from some of the work that we do in Indiana in the Pro Health Group there. Uh, as well as some work um, from other projects that I think is kind of interesting and relevant. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about people. So I know it's been great to see a lot of the different products and devices and cool tools that you guys are building. Um, but for the next uh, 45 minutes, I want to just kind of bubble up a little bit and talk about some of the people um, that use these kinds of things and that can benefit from these kinds of things. Uh, especially the role that these tools can play in changing lives um, and kind of the potential of technology uh, in some of these domains. Uh, so there's going to be three themes I'm going to talk about today. Um, people are more than just patients. Nobody said it should be easy and people are more than just data. Uh, I'll go through each of these uh, one by one, kind of explain what I mean by them, give you some examples to draw from and then we'll come back to them all at the end. So starting with um, people are more than just patients. And I'll start this um, by talking about myself, actually, as a person. So I run. I run maybe four or five days a week. I do yoga. I enjoy doing that, let's say, daily. Uh, I go to the farmer's market every week to buy produce that's going to last me for the week so that I can make lunches, make dinners. Um, I make most of these meals at home for myself. I drink maybe a cup or two of coffee a day and I get eight hours of sleep every night. So I'm basically perfect. It's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> I'm probably the healthiest person you're going to know. Um, I'm a great adult, um, except that none of that is true. I do like running, um, but maybe I go a couple times a week. The only real marathons I do are Netflix marathons. <laughs> I uh, do go to the farmer's market every week. Um, if I can get out of bed in time. It uh, tends to be pretty early in the morning, and it's always a treat when I do get to go, but sometimes that's hard. So I end up eating at the food court for lunch. Uh, I end up buying lunches instead of bringing things from home. Um, I do like sleeping. I try to get to bed at a reasonable hour every night. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm uh, mid-season in Netflix and just have to keep going on that marathon. Sometimes there's a deadline. It doesn't always work. So I end up drinking a lot of coffee during the day. Um, so I run sometimes, I do yoga when I'm stressed, I go to the farmer's market if I have time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's a little bit more normal um, than I'm going to give myself credit for. But people sometimes have priorities other than their health. Um, and I've seen this even since having been here, say at the opening reception, um, and I won't name names, but. Somebody commented, oh, I should really have these vegetables, but those spring rolls look really good. Uh, or I played hockey, so it's totally okay if I have this beer. And we make those kinds of um, micro decisions and negotiations 100 times a day. Um, and so often these are things, you know, kind of split second decisions about what would be fun, what would I like, but sometimes these are also very socially motivated decisions. Um, and this is particularly true, I think, in certain kinds of populations, um, specifically in chronic disease populations. So I'll talk about um, one project that I worked on uh, with a guy named Alec Bird, who's uh, graduated now from IU. And he was interested in studying uh, technology in the lives of people with diabetes um, and how they transition from being young and having their parents kind of look after a lot of their care for them um, take on a lot of that management and kind of diet management, glucose management, transitioning into managing that on their own as adults. And what, one of the things that he found was that people, um, you know, they like to be social. They're teenagers. They want to be able to do fun things and want their friends to think highly of them. Um, one of the people we talked to really likes biking and didn't have, at the time, a continuous glucose monitoring system. So when she would go biking, her blood sugar levels would be all over the place. Um, be high, be low, and then it was low again and again, and she'd have an average of maybe two to four low blood sugars every bike ride. And so that doesn't stop her from bike riding. That's something that she enjoys, something her friends were doing, um, and she comes up with some strategies to kind of manage that as best she can. Um, we have now, I think, technology that can help her do this a lot better, um, but she's basically making a decision that she knows is not necessarily in the best interest of her health. Uh, we had another participant who uh, 
really liked playing sports. I think he's actually a nurse now, and so this kind of also comes into play during his work if he's working long shifts. Um, and the low blood sugars were something he'd just fight through because that's what you've got to do. You don't really want to be different than anybody else. You don't want to use it as an excuse. Um, so for him, that kind of social aspect was worth kind of pushing through these things, making some bad decisions sometimes. This is especially true also when we look at some kind of underserved populations. Um, so people maybe of lower social economic status um, who make these same kinds of social decisions but also sometimes are uh, in some ways cornered into these decisions if uh, they're of limited resources. So, uh, uh, so we did another study of people of lower um, economic status who uh, were living on food stamp programs and um, had to kind of manage that. So they would do things sometimes like go to grocery stores and uh, you can get a lot of ramen for $1.50 and that would last their family through the week. It was something they knew wasn't healthy. They wished they could buy more fruits and vegetables but it wasn't necessarily an option for them. Um, this is another study I did, sorry, from personal informatics. Um, this is a project I worked on as an undergrad at the University of Calgary, actually, with uh, Anthony Tang and Sheila Carpendale. And we were studying the role of wireless technologies, personal data collection, self-tracking, quantified self-movement in people with uh, common chronic illnesses, um, in this case, epilepsy. And so this was a guy who, um, who knew after years of kind of collecting data about himself that alcohol was something that for him was a trigger of seizures. And um, he knew this, he would go out with friends and say, okay, I can have this drink anyway. Um, I know that I'm gonna pay for it, but it makes me more in control, which is something epilepsy took away in the first place. So we see that people make these kind of decisions every day, especially when people have common chronic illnesses um, or they have uh, kind of different uh, context to their lives. And really the only people who understand that are the people who are going through it. There is nobody who is a better, nobody who understands better what it is to be Haley than I do. And nobody who understands what it means to be you than you do. And nobody who understands what it means to be the girl with diabetes or the guy with epilepsy or the mother trying to feed a family off of food stamps than they do. People are really the best experts in their own lives. And in most of these cases, none of us have any sort of medical background or medical training um, to contribute to these decisions. But that doesn't mean that we're not the ones who face those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you learn a lot about a condition you're living with just by having experienced it over and over and over again. Um, so the goal here is to leverage this kind of expertise that people have about themselves to help people make better informed decisions. So that if you're gonna make a bad decision, and by bad, I mean a decision that's not necessarily in the best interest of your health. You're at least doing so from an informed perspective, um, preferably from a data-supported perspective, and you're at least aware of what the trade-offs and the consequences of those behaviors are. So I mentioned this quote earlier um, about the guy with epilepsy who says, okay, I can have this drink, but I wanna draw your attention to the second part of the quote, um, that I know I'm gonna pay for it, and it just makes me much more in control. That this is something he doesn't do lightly. He um, in this case has a spreadsheet that has columns for all of the different um, pieces of data that he felt were relevant to track. So he tracks things like um, how he slept, uh, the alcohol he's consumed, certain foods he knows are triggered, um, his medication, how he's feeling. A lot of data goes into making that decision in his case. Um, and that's something that took him a long time to do. He's been living with this for a long time. Um, there was a lot of trial and error in figuring some of this out. But it's a decision that's coming from a lot more uh, informed place. Um, this is a project that we worked on. Uh, I worked on this with Scott Chepper, Danique Ferguson, and Steve Layton, um, where we were kind of interested in helping people make these decisions actually in the moment when that's relevant. Um, in this case, in a grocery store, uh, this is a system we call Better Bites, and it sits on top of your grocery cart. You can scan your loyalty card, which gives the system a little bit more information about you as well. You answer one question every time you shop. So we learned a little bit more about you over time. And it's something that you can opt into. So you don't have to do anything, really. Um, if you would like to, um, you can scan, say, a food item. Let's say cheesies or Cheetos in this case. Um, and it will give you three kind of randomly selected options from um, a set of foods that are in the same kind of category. So in this case, we pick rice cakes, edamame, and pirate's booty, um, all of which are at least slightly healthier than Cheetos, um, 
and in kind of a similar price range. Um, Pirate Speedy is a little bit more expensive in this case, but it gives you the information here to make that decision for yourself. So there's not really a persuasive aspect of this. Um, the system isn't really trying to change anyone's behavior. We're simply giving people the information that they need to make those decisions for themselves. So people, I think, are really more than just patients. It takes a lot of kind of experience to be able to make those decisions in a smart way, um, but it's really uh, the people who are living in these contexts and these situations that have the best expertise um, and ability to make those decisions. The next theme I want to talk about is uh, something I'm calling nobody said it should be easy. Um, and this is kind of where a lot of the AMP ecosystem starts to come in. And we've got all of these cool devices, so much new technology, so much new data, so many new sensors. Um, you can do all of this stuff between them, and I think that's awesome. It's really great to see how much technology has advanced. Um, even since I was an undergrad, um, there's been a lot of new developments, and I think that's really cool. Um, and one of the things that's cool about this is we can get a lot of this data now automatically. Um, so there's a study that I like to talk about um, this is not my work at all. This is work by Arthur Stone. Um, and they had people, uh, sorry, there was a doctor who requested that patients for two weeks track their pain at specific intervals during the day. So say three times a day in a notebook, you're supposed to write down what your pain level is, say on a scale of one to 10. And um, they'd outfitted these notebooks with sensors so that you could tell actually what time of day people were writing in them. And one of the things they found in this study is that people don't actually do that over the course of two weeks. That people would come, um, not even before they left their house, but sit literally in the parking lot of the doctor's office and backfill two weeks of data all at once. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I ate for breakfast two days ago, let alone what kind of pain I was in at 10 o'clock two weeks ago on Monday morning. Um, so this kind of data then isn't really all that reliable. It's not very trustworthy. Um, in a lot of cases, it isn't complete. And so having this kind of sensor data, I think is cool because now I don't have to do any work. I don't have to write down my pain level three times a day. I don't have to sit in the doctor's office and backfill all of that information. I have perfect, complete data um, for myself. So yay. Um, which kind of leads to the follow-up question then of what else can we sense? Um, what is new and coming down? the pipes um, of things that are currently really hard to track um, that I would love to be able to see done automatically. And the big one that I'm kind of interested in is food tracking. Um, this is something a lot of people are working on really hard right now. Um, there's some kind of new developments that are pretty cool, but it is a challenging problem to begin with. Um, so there's kind of four different samples I just picked here of different ways people are going about addressing this. Um, uh, the CO or SCIO, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, sensor where you kind of point the little light at your food and supposedly it will tell you exactly what's in it. Um, the GOBI sensor uh, uses, I think, information from your skin or even light um, kind of into your bloodstream, things like that to try to assess calories um, and possibly nutrients. Uh, vessel is a mug, so this will be useful for liquids, can tell the difference between um, drinking water and drinking coffee, drinking a beer. Uh, and then a plate um, that kind of has, I think, weight sensors and um, some stuff going on there. So all of these kind of different approaches people are taking to try to sense food, which is something that's been traditionally really challenging to do. Um, a lot of these products I don't think are even out yet or released, so I'll be really excited to see how it all works out. Um, but uh, it's kind of still not easy. Um, and there's other things like this too. So mood uh, is something people are working on. There's some kind of physiological aspects to that people are trying to play around with. Um, certain kinds of medical symptoms, pain, uh, headaches, stomach aches, things like that, uh, that it would be great if we could do that. Um, but it is kind of challenging problems and that's why we find them exciting. Um, but just because we can sense things um, in the background automatically doesn't necessarily mean we should. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, this is a model um, from Ian Lee. It's called the Stage-Based Model of Personal Informatics Systems. It's one of my favorites. And so uh, collection is kind of a big part of this model. And this is what a lot of um, what I've been talking about is. So all of the sensors, collecting all of this data is something that you know, we're doing pretty well. We're working hard. We're doing it better and better and better every year. And one of the pieces that gets forgotten a lot, I think, is reflection. How do we actually encourage people to do something with this data, to benefit from it, to make healthier decisions, um, to improve their lives using this data? Um, 
So if we have something that's completely in the background, um, say I've got an app on my smartphone that will track my steps for me, um, and this is different from say a wristband that I used to use because it just does it. I don't have to do anything, I don't have to start it, stop it, I don't have to remember to put it on. And um, I happen to really like that because I'm kind of a data nerd and I like to go and look at those graphs and charts, but it'd be pretty easy to forget you know, if it just completely runs in the background all of the time. So I might not get quite as much insight out of that or quite as many benefits from it. On the other hand, if, um, say, food, let's go back to that example, I decide, okay, in the next two weeks, I'm going to lose 50 pounds, I'm going to document everything I'm eating, track all of my calories, all of my nutrients, I'm going to be so healthy. Um, the chances of me actually being able to stick to that are pretty low. It's a pretty burdensome thing to be tracking all of that data. And I'm less likely to kind of continue that. So ideally, we want to find kind of a sweet spot of you know, being able to collect data in an easy way that doesn't make me frustrated, doesn't make me want to give up, um, kind of happens in the background as much as possible, but still give it to people in a way that makes sense for them, um, where they still are getting that kind of insight, getting some benefits from it, that sort of thing. And the, the sweet spot, I'm going to punt a little bit on this and say it depends, I think, a lot on the person. Uh, it depends on what the data is. It depends on what your goals are. Um, and so for me, I, you know, I like data. I think this is a lot of fun. Somebody else, maybe not so much, might make, take different approaches. And I'll give you an example here of a population that is fairly motivated and does put a lot of effort into their tracking um, and into their own kind of research and data process um, where that kind of burden is a little, the threshold for the burden is a little bit higher. Um, so I, the kind of core of my dissertation work is on people with rare diseases. Um, these are things that by definition impact uh, less than 0.05% of the population. Um, so very small number of people. Uh, how many of you have heard of ALS? Show of hands. There you go. So that's a pretty common one um, that you will have heard of, likely because of the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge recently. Um, you might have heard of it before that. It's fairly well known. Um, but it impacts about 0.02% of the world's population. So a very small number of people. Um, but there's actually over 7,000 different rare diseases, and so when we start to look at all of them combined, all of a sudden we're talking about 10% of the world's population, which is a substantially bigger number. Um, to put that in perspective for you, only 3% of the world population uses Twitter, and if everyone with a rare disease lived in the same country, it would be the third biggest country in the world. Um, but because these diseases are so rare, um, it, there's not a lot known about them. There's not a lot of research taking place on any specific rare disease. Um, one of my participants says the receptionist doesn't understand, the doctor doesn't understand, no one's heard of it, and so it's a really strange spot to be in. So people here, um, they can't really rely on their doctors as much for that information. They have to take control of this a lot more themselves, and because it's something that they live with, they're very motivated to do this. Um, they find each other online in these communities. Um, they will collect up their medical records and even trade them with each other or post them online. They keep kind of detailed notes. They do a lot of research and a lot of Googling. Um, and so this is a population who, if there is benefit to be gained from doing things the hard way, that is something that they are willing to do. Which isn't to say, of course, that technology should be needlessly complicated, but in cases where we can't yet get the data that these people need, um, they are willing to do a little bit more work. Um, and kind of um, the point of all this, I guess, is to say that um, it's great, and I'm really excited about all of the data that we can get, but I would love for us to consider also what we're doing with it, and who are the people that are using it and benefiting from it, and how can we give them more value from that data. Um, the final point that I want to talk about is that people are more than just data. And so I'll go back to this graphic again, because I like this one a lot. Um, that I have a pretty good picture of myself um, as a kind of healthy person or an unhealthy person as a result of this data, and especially combined and with all of the interoperability, all of the different devices and the connections between them, you can paint a pretty good picture. Um, but what this doesn't necessarily tell you um, is some of the more experien experiential aspects of it. So you see this um, magazine spread that I pulled out um, talking about the quantified self community, and that's, I think, a very kind of niche group of people who um, really like data, they like numbers, and this kind of idea of being just a number is something that they're really excited about. 
Um, but for a lot of people, numbers are just numbers, and looking at this is kind of confusing and um, not necessarily that meaningful, and so kind of bringing all of that sensor data together, um, all of those numbers into some sort of presentable way to really capture what it actually means to um, go for a run during the sunrise this morning and how beautiful that was, or how I felt after that, and um, kind of the big picture and combining all of these things, the way that the AMP Plus um, ecosystem kind of allows us to do, I think is great. Um, so looking not just at a quantified self, but at a qualified self, and at what a lot of that actually means. Um, and there's a few projects here that we've done, um, kind of looking at some of that as well, um, trying to capture that data and present it in the way that makes sense given the context, or given the question or the problem that people are facing. Um, this is a project called um, Muscle Memory, um, mostly done by Kim Oaks. Um, I helped out a little bit, and Katie Seek. Um, where we built a knee sleeve, basically, and this was for uh, high-intensity group-based exercise communities. And so when you're uh, working out and you're doing squats, um, the sensor on your knee sleeve will tell you basically when you are below parallel, so when the um, angle of your knee is less than 90 degrees, um, and the colors kind of on the side of it will adjust accordingly. So giving that feedback um, kind of right when you're doing the squats. And we found out uh, when we were trying this in the field that actually lights on the side doesn't make a lot of sense because if you're doing squats and you have to look, um, all of a sudden you've got other problems that we've created. So we're, uh, we've been playing around the last uh, kind of semester or so with different ways of communicating that feedback, audio or haptic feedback. Um, but that's kind of some of the idea that we've been working on there. Um, there's another project called Health Sense that we do, um, again, with some of this kind of uh, wearable data or sensor data, um, but with kids this time. And so we give them tools and teach workshops. Um, this is uh, largely Katie Seek's work, again, um, who will take uh, these workshops with kids and they'll build things like this. So this is a, a headband um, outfitted with some sensors that measures, I think, light or brightness, um, because this girl wanted to be able to tell you know, how much time she was spending outside in a day, and then we see things like this that they make, um, where each flower kind of represents um, some piece of data, and there's lights in there. So it might be activity level, might be time spent outside. Um, so a lot of kind of really creative approaches that these kids come up with using just really very simple technology, um, paper circuits, um, copper tape, some conductive thread, and get them really engaged in kind of making this a lot on their own. And you kind of learn pretty quickly, I think, what is important to them and what their goals are. Um, so that's been kind of a really fun one to hear about. And that kind of summarizes the three big themes. So I talked about um, people being more than just patients, um, feeling like people should be empowered and able to make decisions about their own health, and looking at ways that we can inform people or empower them to do that from kind of a data-driven, more intelligent perspective, because they are really the only people who know their lives as well as they do. Um, looking also at um, sometimes ways that technology makes things easy in a way that is actually harmful. So looking at ways of presenting data in a useful and meaningful way so that people still get the benefits from it, um, not just because of automating it, but also looking back and seeing it again. And then finally, um, capturing some of the more experiential aspects of this data collection, of this um, uh, kind of sensor universe that we're living in and bringing that all together in kind of interesting and creative ways. Um, I think we're going to put these slides online. There's some resources if you're interested in any of those projects further. Um, but with uh, the time that's left, I would love to chat more um, and take questions if anyone has any. <laughs>